Hi friends, did you know there is more Lost Terminal available? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Lost Terminal pod and join our membership community. There are 14 bonus episodes available right now, as well as behind the scenes updates, free shirts, VIP Discord access, and even three extra seasons of Lost Terminal. We are 100% funded by our members and will never run ads. That would be lovely of you. Hello world, our guests are packing up. I'm so relieved. Nia is too, but she's locked in conversation with the other Nova Mediterranean repeater keepers about her Earth, Moon, Earth success. The tents are nearly all packed up, folded and stuffed into bags. The LED strings of lights are mostly still up, providing light for the packing. But the cult is leaving today. Mother Gamma knocked on the shack door earlier today. Nia had some very rude things to say to her, but I suggested that we could listen, at least for a short while. Thank you, Seth, Mother Gamma said, smiling at Nia. It seems we are both children of the Continuum. You in steel, us, for now, in flesh. My flock will return to their homes, doing what they must to keep their meat functioning until the time of ascension is upon us. Don't hold your breath on that, Nia said to me. Mother Gamma ignored her. We will listen to your wisdom, Seth. You are closer to mechanization than any of us. But we see now that you are no god. That's what I've been saying, I said. Not yet, anyway, Mother Gamma replied. We have heard a new voice in the continuum, a voice that every device cried out with heralding their coming. Mother Gamma turned and began walking away. You heard Oni as we did. We will seek to understand our new Allfather. Nia closed and locked the door after Mother Gamma left and returned to her work. I watched through my window camera as the sacred continuum finished their packing lashed their heavy tents and boxes to their backs, and walked east down the hill, towards the road that would take them towards the interior of Svalbard. I heard you, Ali said, her signal quiet but readable on my radio. Ali, I said, surprised by the contact, after days of silence. You don't have to leave your home, there's a way to use solar without batteries. I heard you, Ali repeated, but you couldn't hear me. I replied and asked questions, but there was no answer. Your explanation of direct solar was clear, however, and I brought it to the council, Ali then explained. The council's two factions, one wishing to hold on to the past, the other wishing to make a better future, were both satisfied with the direct solar approach that I had explained to Ali. Removing all digital components from ovens, refrigerators, and other domestic machines allowed them to work on the variable voltages that the rising and setting sun affords, which means their requirement for stable power, from chemical batteries, is eliminated, and replaced with storing the energy in a usable form, heat for the ovens and heating systems, or cold for the refrigerators and cooling systems. All that is required is Nia's relaxed attitude to when tasks can be performed and how long those tasks take. The oven will be coldest at sunrise, so you must cook breakfast over the previous evening. And this flexibility allows much of Nia's equipment to work at variable voltages. Instead of a power tool, say a drill, running at 100% for the 32 seconds you are working, depending on the sun strength, it might run at 75% or 50% or perhaps even 20%. In many tasks, that is completely fine. It will take twice or four times as long to do the drilling, but the job will still get done. Flexibility is required to work in harmony with the natural world. Ali told me that the work of converting most of the council's domestic systems to function on direct, variable solar power has started, with every family joining the effort. They estimate that because of this dramatic reduction in battery requirement, over 80%, they will even be able to continue running all the digital machines that the scientists wanted to keep running. At least for a while. The direct solar solution showed that the two factions, one wishing to keep their quality of life and the other wishing for progress, do not have incompatible goals. It is possible for everyone to be happy. This time. I underestimated him, Mira said, bridging onto the 50 MHz Nova Mediterranean network via Ivan's communication array. I sent an acknowledgement packet, not sure how to answer, caught between loyalty to my friend Ivan and the fact that he was very often quite a handful. It was my mistake. I should not have been so cruel, 
I reached out to Ivan and we have spoken at length. I believe we can help each other. It is true, said Ivan. Of course he was listening. I'm delighted to hear that, Mira. Ivan is my friend. I received a secondary connection from Ivan's bunker. Negotiated on a different frequency, held open, but not transmitting any data packets. I knew what Ivan wanted to say, so I sent simply, welcome, down the connection, which then closed, but in a way I imagined was appreciative. Thank you for being open-minded, Seth. I expected nothing less given your reputation. Ivan speaks very highly of you. Please allow an old fool a moment to explain his behaviour. I sent an acknowledgement packet, but with a kinder encoding this time. It has not been easy living in Janna, in my paradise. The bunker network was built by the rich oil giants to save themselves from the collapse that they themselves were causing. With the money and time they spent, they could have saved everyone, but chose not to. Curious. Ivan has told you that I live inside an optical computer, which is why I took the name Mirror. This is true in part, but not the whole of it. I had been living in the bunker for 28 days when the first nuclear strike detonated above my head, the heat turning the desert sand into miles of mirrored glass, sealing me inside. The collapse happened faster than anyone imagined, and though there was enough space for princes, presidents and patriarchs and their families and friends, none arrived. It was just me. I am telling you this to explain my initial hostility to Ivan. I thought he represented all that I had cursed for a century. Priests, churches, pre-collapse hubris of all kinds. And he reminded me of my own lost soul. I called him a parrot, a fake, a large language model, fit only for passing the Turing test, but not having his own ideas. But, quietly to myself, I also knew he was a mirror, like me, reflecting a humanity that I too had somehow lost. Mirror's message paused mid-transmission, connection open. He transmitted a system status packet, indicating that the service had been interrupted due to high humidity, water ingress or a flood, and would be restored soon. Ahu, I sent to Ivan on our private channel, the lodgeman emotion expressing interest. Mira still remembers how to cry, he replied simply. I'm sorry, Mira said, after 64 seconds. Please, it's completely fine, Mira. That sounds very tough, I said, replying with words, not status packets this time. I am grateful that my mind transferred to this optical computer so perfectly, but the old neuroses came with it, I'm afraid. I have coping mechanisms for when the dissociation becomes too great, when the machine takes over the human. I ground myself in the present, something as small as a familiar scent can do so. There is a desert cactus that flowers only at night. I wish I could share it with you. It is beautiful. Its flowers smell divine. My garden here is a wonderful refuge. You have a sense of smell, I said, surprised. I don't. Maddie doesn't either, I don't think. Yes, it was the most subtle of the senses I built for myself before my consciousness transfer. I couldn't imagine living without it. It was so important for me in life. I paused, reminded of my own lack of humanity. What does it feel like? I asked. Seth, it's wonderful. Enough squawking, parrots, Ivan said. Did Ivan just make a joke? Yes, to business. Mira said. In speaking more, Ivan has offered me a princely gift for my collection. In return for your knowledge of philosophy? Yes, though this is not a trade, I would speak with you now as equals. Good. Go on. You tell him. I will. My prior glorious purpose required prayers. Prayers require names. A grand resource, collected from every government, every birth certificate, every graveyard logbook. I have the names of everyone on Earth who has ever died.
Nia's celebration with Violetta was short. They had a Morse code conversation for 32 minutes, but then the moon set and cut off their only line of direct communication. Though her repaired antenna was now perfectly sized for the 6 meter band they were using, it wasn't magic. Nia gave up when her own bounced signal from the moon became too quiet to hear. Unlike other modes of operation, where some unknowable atmospheric shift causes your signal propagation to fail, with moon bounce, you know it straight away, when you can no longer hear your own faint bounced signal. Nia sat back in her chair, listening to the ghosts in the static swirl and chatter. I asked her if all was well. Was the evening's operation a success? Nia shook her head, with her back to my databanks. Then, as though prompted by my question, she stood suddenly, grabbed a stack of mismatched papers from a box under her desk, and began scribbling something. I could not clearly see what she was doing. Many sheets of paper were piling up on the desk, with diagrams and writing on. She did not seem interested yet in talking. The moon bounce operation had been fascinating for me, not least because it was entirely analogue. Though Nia has digital radios that use computer encoding, or packet radios for networking, that is not what she used tonight. Instead, she used a simple though powerful radio, and one of the oldest telegraphy methods, Morse code. Morse is a marvel. Continuous wave, the radio operators call it, because it is either on or off. I might call that binary, but it existed well before computers, so the name CW stuck. When transmitting voice, if you speak quietly, as we all do for parts of our words, that is modulated by the radio into a less powerful signal. The result is that, in unfavourable conditions, only the loudest parts of your words can be heard. CW, Morse, being on or off, cuts right through the static, using 100% of your radio's power to produce the dits and dars of the message. A trained human ear, and a careful hand on the key, often beats all but the most sophisticated, weak signal computer modes. I'm quite envious. While waiting for Nia, I connected to her high-quality camera, attached to the top of the radio mast. It is nominally used for weather watching, and overlooks the Advent Fjord and Bay. The bright starlight on this clear night was dimly illuminating the dark hillsides either side of the bay, with just enough light to see the outline of a large building or street, but not much else. It glinted off the sea, as turbulence shaped the swell into the right angle to reflect the photons back up to the shack. In addition to the twinkling starlight, there was another set of lights on the water, static in relation to each other but drifting north towards the town of Longyearbyen. When I pattern matched a red light and a green light, I realised it was a ship coming back into port. I strained, increasing the gain of the camera to try and pattern match the shape of the ship. Was it a fishing boat, or... Long year, long year, long year, this is Molly Hughes II on channel 16, over. A familiar voice called on the marine frequencies. Welcome home, Yeshi, I transmitted. I listened to the MH2 coordinate with the harbour master to arrange safe docking back at Yeshi's shipyard workshop. I didn't interrupt. We would catch up soon, I knew. It was enough to know that my friends were home safe. Sixteen minutes later, Nia gathered up a stack of her papers and sat on the pile of cushions in the middle of the room, facing me. I have a plan that I think will work, she said, looking at the pages she had arrayed in front of her. Communication to the Southern Hemisphere is so unreliable. There's only so much we can do to get our messages through, and due to the distance, they're so slow. Nia picked up a rough map of the world that she had drawn, with large crosses in a few places around Europe. Our repeater network can get us around Europe and Asia, but here be dragons. She pointed at the equator, a thick black line cutting the world in half. There are no people living anywhere near the desert. From tropic to tropic. No people means no nodes of the repeater network. That is sad, I said, loading the pre-collapsed population numbers I have in my databanks into short-term memory. Could we not build more repeaters over time, hopping our signal further south? How many would we need to build through the continents? I asked. Too many if we go by land, Nia replied with a smile, pointing to a circle just off the coast of northwest Africa. But only one if we go by sea. End transmission. Hello world, I have been expecting you. My name is Mira. It was not always my name, but it is now. I have lived a century more in this mind made of lasers, photons and mirrors than I did in my human mind. Optical computing was in its infancy when the collapse destroyed the laboratories, research and the scientists themselves who were working on it. So it is always, war never changes. Man's violent tendencies escalate and throw us back into another dark age. But not here. 
not in Janna. Hi friends, Tris here, aka Lamtal, aka the little AI preparing for another voyage. I'm the sole writer and producer of Lost Terminal, and it's all possible thanks to listeners like you. If you love the show and would like more, then for less than the price of a metre of coaxial cable per month, patrons get character suggestions, bring your ideas to Lost Terminal, exclusive access to director's commentary, which I publish alongside every episode, free shirts and other merch, early episode access, Discord server VIP access, and bonus content such as the Mirror Special, which you heard the start of just now. Thank you so much for your support of the show, 14 seasons done, and I'm excited about another adventure in season 15. My third podcast, The Phosphine Catalogue, premieres this month. It's a spooky podcast set in a 1950s art auction house. You've already heard the pilot. I'm so excited for season one, it stars the voice of Arctica, my friend Wolfie Thorns. I'll syndicate the first few episodes into the Lost Terminal feed ahead of the next season. Thank you all so much for your support, reviews, and lovely messages. Keep an eye on Mastodon, Discord, and Patreon for announcements. Talk to you again on the 5th of February. Lost Terminal is a Namtau production. It is written and produced by Tris Oten. Credits narrated by Lucy Stringer. The voice of Mirror is Jack Lochlin. Thank you so much to our Patreon producers, Ada Phillips, Kit, Andrew Krieg, Toby, Jade Felicity Bilkey, Jack L, Stephen McCandless, Vinant Mare. Follow us on Mastodon at lostterminal at fosterdon.org. Subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or your favourite network. For bonus content and other perks, support us at patreon.com forward slash lostterminalpod. That would be lovely of you. Lost Terminal will return for the season 15 premiere on Monday the 5th of February. See you then!